Good morning, everybody. We will go ahead and uh, get this meeting started. If I can have uh, Ms. Cicchetti, mm -hmm. please call the roll. Good morning, everyone. Chair Vasquez. Present. Vice Chair Lieber. Here. Member Gaines. Here. Member Schaefer. Here. Deputy Controller Emron. Present. So we do have a quorum. Everybody's in attendance. With that, we will start with the first order of business. Opening up with our Pledge of Allegiance, if I can have you all please stand. With that, I want to open up with some opening remarks before I turn it back over to Ms. Chiquetti. And it was, <coughs> March is, is a real kind of an impacted month. You have, uh, obviously, the International Women's uh, Celebration that takes place pretty much the whole month of March. But then you also have it tied into uh, Cesar Chavez. You know, we celebrate his birthday on the 31st at the end of the month. And this being our last meeting in March, I thought it'd be appropriate to at least make mention of it, and then I'll tie it into Women's International. I know there's others that want to uh, also have some opening remarks, so we'll turn, open up the floor as well. But <clears throat> in opening up the meeting today, I just wanted to do it in recognition of Cesar Chavez Day, which is celebrated annually on March 31st in honor and remembrance of Cesar Chavez, an American farm worker, labor leader, and civil rights activist who with Dolores Huerta, who co-founded the United States uh, farm workers, Chavez worked tirelessly to draw national attention to the inhumane working conditions and inadequate wages experienced by agricultural workers across the United States, and he inspired people across the, in the country to fight for safe and healthy workplaces, better wages, improved workplace protections from sickness and disability, and other core rights and protections. Cesar Chavez Day, which is in both the federal holiday and the California state holiday, is a day we remember his hard work to bring justice, equity, dignity, hope, and voice, not only for the agricultural workers, but also for workers everywhere. Uh, I had the privilege and the honor to uh, carry his casket, uh, very simple pine casket, in April uh, of 93 as a sitting council member in Santa Monica. And it was so moving to see so many people from all up and down the state and even outside of the state come together and do this post session as we were walking through Delano uh, back in 93. And of course, you know, Dolores Huerta, which many of us have had the experience and the opportunity to meet. Uh, she's come, actually, she's come to both of our swearing ins back in 2018 and then again just recently. Uh, and she was also one of the co-founders and talking about International Women's Month. I mean, I can't think of a better person to honor as well. I mean, this uh, woman is in her 90s, I believe, 92, 93 now. And the she's April 10th coming up. Coming up. But she's got so much energy, I hope I could even walk when I'm in my 90s. <laughs> uh, she came to my local sewing in in 2018, and she was dancing up a storm, and I couldn't believe it at, <laughs> in her 90s. But uh, with that, I'll let me turn it over to uh, uh, several of the members here. I'll start with uh, Member Gaines, who has right, some yeah. open remarks as well. Yeah, I just uh, I want to, again, recognize, thank you for your comments about Cesar Chavez and the great things that he did. And... Um, you know, representing the unrepresented yeah. is so important and something that we uh, always have to keep in mind, especially as elected officials, that we are serving our constituents and uh, individuals that don't have the means, mm -mm. any other means of getting whatever it is they need to get done. And whether it's an issue of fairness or um, <coughs> an issue of injustice, we've got to make sure that those voices are heard. So thank you for that. Um, but I also just want to take a moment here because we've got a couple of birthdays oh. coming up <laughs> and our fellow member, Mike uh, Schaefer, is having a birthday on Saturday along with our executive director, 
uh, Vet Stowers on Sunday. So I just want to take that and, and recognize you mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. hope that you have a great birthday and that you celebrate and life is so precious that we need to make sure that we are enjoying it uh, in the time that we've been given here on earth. So mm -hmm. God bless birthday. you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, our vice chair, Ms. Lieber, also has some opening remarks as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I, I really appreciate uh, hearing your personal reflection about Cesar and how blessed we are to still have Dolores Huerta with us. And they are obviously two remarkable Californians who have really changed the world through their activism. And uh, it's, it's a great tie-in to Women's History Month and International Women's Day to uh, recognize Dolores Huerta is really a, a world figure who has given uh, so much hope to so many people. And um, as the, the woman who's on the board here, along with our, our state controller, when uh, she's here uh, for matters that require her presence, uh, I hope that I can bring the perspective of many different women uh, because women in our society and in our world uh, really shape uh, our reality of how things uh, can work in the future in a better and more equitable way and give us all support uh, every single day. And um, I'd like to give a special shout out to women in government service and who really make uh, the, the gears of government work in a very uh, efficient and competent and compassionate and thorough way. Uh, we really, really appreciate everything that is done by the women of uh, our agency and all the women that are supporting um, in the background and that allow us to do our work every day. And I, too, wanted to recognize that uh, a notable uh, woman who we all depend on is our executive officer, mm -hmm. uh, Yvette Stowers. And I'd like to take a moment of uh, personal privilege to uh, present her with um, a token of our esteem and to recognize her special day. <laughs> We have a nice fresh bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Thank you. And again, I want to thank Ms. Stowers for everything that she does for this agency and uh, how professionally she does her work uh, every single day. Uh, I think that all of all of the women that she leads and the men that she leads uh, and all the workers who contribute to our efforts are just doing an outstanding job. And so I want to recognize you in that way. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, you know, I'll chime in as well. I mean, you know, when I met uh, Yvette the first time, uh, she was sitting up here in the <laughs> dais with us, uh, didn't know much about her background. And when the opening came up, I was just taken back when I looked at her resume and I said, wait a minute, what are we doing? A, we don't need to do a search. We have somebody in-house. So it was great. And it was, a, it was a blessing. Plus, you know, just the history she had not with the department. And then, of course, the BOE sitting up here representing the controller uh, for those years. Really appreciate it. And, and she did a real great transition. I mean, she's been, hasn't missed a step. Because Brenda Fleming, for those of you that know, I thought was exceptional for us uh, during those times when we were just kind of reorganizing the BOE. She was so instrumental. And Yvette, you've pretty much stepped right into her shoes. I was a little worried at the beginning, thinking, oh, you know, how's this going to go? I thought maybe we were going to need a little coaching, but no, it didn't happen. Uh, with that, oh, yes, we have our deputy controller. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Good morning to everyone. Uh, happy birthday to you, Executive Director Stowers, and to you, uh, Member Mike Schaefer. Uh, more life and more blessings. Um, 
Every March, Women's History Month recognizes the contribution of the fearless and ambitious women who challenge the status quo in the pursuit of equality, justice, and opportunity. We honor the pioneers and trailblazing women whose historic milestones date back to the founding of our nation and celebrate the women of today whose work ensures our daughters have the same equal opportunity as our sons. Too often, you are the unsung heroes and your many contributions go unnoticed. And we also honor the bravery and sacrifice of the more than 200 years of women who have courageously served in the United States military. military. Today, more than 200,000 women represent 16% of our nation's armed first forces, and I salute the 2 million plus women veterans. The 2023 Women's History theme is celebrating women who tell our stories. This theme honors women who have devoted their lives and talents to pursuing truths and who have taken incredible strides to fully exercise their human rights and fundamental freedoms. The story of countless women heroes is America's story, and we stand on their shoulders from the generations of black women and girls who fought to end slavery and advocate for civil rights, to the Latinx women who marched for labor reform to help all workers secure better wages, benefits, and safety, to Native American women who champion environmental justice and a cleaner earth, and to the women of the suffrage movement who helped enshrine the 19th Amendment into our Constitution, which makes it illegal to deny the right to vote to any citizen based on their sex. So today, on behalf of the controller and Moving forward, I reaffirm my commitment to advancing the rights and opportunities for all women and girls here in this state because a woman's story grows our collective understanding and strengthens the connection we all have to each other. Uh, board members, I also wanted to take a moment to extend my best wishes to the Muslim community across California and the United States on the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan. Ramadan is a sacred month which gives the opportunity to practice patience, spiritual growth, show forgiveness, and compassion for those less fortunate. Ramadan is also an opportunity to recognize the many contributions that Muslim Americans continue to make from healthcare professionals, first responders, teachers, lawyers, and more. Muslims have been on the front lines, united in faith, humanity, and a call to service. And this month of reflection begins. Let's continue to stand up and speak out against bigotry, hate, and persecution. No person in America should ever live in fear for practicing their religion or appearance. I stand committed with the controller in safeguarding the religious freedom and civil rights of all Californians. So to the, all those celebrating, I wish you a blessed and peaceful month, Ramadan Kareem. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. And to also to inform us and educate us a little bit about that history as well. Uh, I have uh, Member Schaefer also wants to say a few opening remarks. Well, thank you, Ted, for the uh, nice uh, Remarks, you stole my thunder. I was going to toot my own horn as having a birthday. Uh, you know, being in politics, we're not blessed with uh, all that much humility. We, uh, to survive, we have to toot our own horn. Uh, uh, Dolores Hurt, uh, you, there's a lot more about her you don't know. She has 11 children and 13 grandchildren. Uh, she's the chief fundraiser for, it's her kid or her grandkid that are running for Board of Supervisors in Bakersfield. Uh, she always sets me up for a contribution, and I always comply because those of us who raise money are the first to want to help others. And uh, I'm so pleased that one of my benefits of being on the board is to get to know Dolores because she pays a lot of attention to us. We have a birthday today in the entertainment world. I always bring one of those to our attention. That's William Shatner, mm -hmm. who I think is getting to be 90 and has had a fantastic career. We know him from uh, movies, and we know him from commercial advertising. Uh, we have a woman named Vera Plain, who's remarkable. She's going to turn 100 years old in five days on the 27th. She was the widow of the financial editor of the San Diego Union Tribune, who uh, back in the 1960s was a crusading financial editor and writing about all the financial uh, goings and comings on. And uh, some say he knew too much. Uh, he ended up losing his life back in those days. She's been a widow since the 1970s, but she's having a big party to celebrate her birthday, which is uh, next Monday, and uh, she personally is calling me to be sure that I'm there, so I'm very flattered at that. Uh, my birthday is also the birthday of Elton John, who I have not met, but I've <laughs> seen his Red Piano concert, and it's also the birthday of Mayor Carolyn Goodman of the city of Las Vegas. Uh, she and I are old buddies because uh, I practice law with her husband, uh, Oscar Goodman, who was a gangster lawyer, played himself in the movie Casino, uh, owns a 
condo in California that he escapes to, and uh, he and I are both uh, giving eulogies sometimes for important people who pass. I go over to Las Vegas to speak at somebody's last rites, and there's uh, Oscar going to speak too. In fact, sometimes he's had to leave early and ask me to sub for him, so I'm very flattered about that. So March is a <coughs> month full of uh, great merit, and I'm glad that we take time to recognize it. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I think we're ready to start. Uh, Ms. Cicchetti, if you would please call the first order of business. Sure. Before we get started here, I believe Ms. Cohen is on the line. Oh, she is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ms. Cohen, I want to recognize you. you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All righty. I'm going to do the first order of business is our informational announcement. First, I'd like to remind the audience to silence your cell phones and any other wireless devices. Public comment is, take, comment is taken on each agenda item. The public will be invited to comment during the matters before the board. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak before the board on any agenda item in person, we ask that you complete and submit to the Sergeant of Arms a public comment appearance sheet located at the entrance of the auditorium. If you wish to speak before the board by telephone, please dial the phone number and access code provided on our public agenda notice and follow the instruction of the AT&T moderator. If you intend to make a public comment today using the AT&T moderator, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line prior to the beginning of the agenda item you wish to make a comment. We recommend this is as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay between the live stream and the live event. When giving a public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. The order that the board identifies public comments at the conclusion of an agenda item is as follows. The clerk will first identify any public comment requests that have been received by a board proceeding staff in the auditorium. Then we will identify any public comments with the AT&T moderator. And lastly, we will read into the record any public comments received in writing in advance of today's meeting. This concludes the informational announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chiquetti. With that, if you could please call the first item on the agenda. Mm -hmm. The first item on today's agenda is item F. Other Tax Program Non-Appearance Matters, F1 Audits. This matter will be presented by Ms. Cruz today. F1 Audits, F1A, MCI Communication Services, Inc., 2274, F1B, MCI Metro Access Transmission Services, LLC, 2372, and F1C, U.S. Telepacific Corp., 7757. Ms. Cruz will present these items for your consideration, which may be voted on individually or collectively. These matters are a constitutional function. Therefore, Deputy Controller Emron may not participate in accordance with Government Code Section 7.9. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable members of the board. I'm Michelle Cruz, the manager of the Unitary Valuation and Auditing Section of the State Assessed Property Division. The State Assessed Property Division performs routine audits of state assessees under the authority of California Revenue and Taxation Code 628 and Government Code Section 15618. The purpose of a property tax audit is to determine the accuracy, completeness, and reliability of the financial data furnished by state assessees and used by the board in the valuation process. Audits also include an internal review of methods, calculations, and assumptions used by the State Assessed Property Division. Before you today for your consideration are three property tax audits completed by the State Assessed Property Division staff. The assessees have been presented with a copy of the audit report and given an opportunity to provide additional information in response to the audit report. I'm available to answer any questions if needed, and I ask for your adoption of these three audits. Thank you. Um, you know, I can't see if our controller has her hand up or if she wishes to. No, I don't. I do not have my hand up. I'm okay. here, though. I'm listening. Okay. 
I thought I'd give you the opportunity in case. Okay. <laughs> Any seeing no hands? <clears throat> motion to approve. It's been a motion to approve. And it's I'll been second. Sec and it's been seconded by the controller as well. Do we have any public comment, written comment on this? Let's find out. AT&T moderator, please let us know if there's anyone on the line who'd like to make a public comment regarding this matter. Ladies and gentlemen on the phone, if you'd like to comment, please press 1, then 0 at this time. We do have one in queue, and we're going now to Christine Huey. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Christine Huey, and um, I don't know if I'm out of order or not, but I wanted to bring to attention uh, SCA4. Um, excuse me, yes, I'm you not are. Sure on the, that agenda. Excuse me, Ms. Huey, we, uh, we are not yes. taking comments on that at this time. Uh, there is an opportunity yes. uh, where public comments on items not on the agenda. So you could speak later on in the agenda. If you could just listen in and take a look at the agenda items, you'll, you could call back later if you could listen in. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just, thank you. Okay. Do we have an estimated time as to when she might call back? Around 11.30 or so is when yeah, a good time okay. we're, we're going to be doing the um, legislative okay. research and statistic okay. divisions time. So you could call back during that item. Ms. Huey, is that good for you? Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we have, we don't have any written comments. I was just going to say oh, we okay, have no ahead. written comments that no one has uh, submitted in for this item. And we have no one in the audience who has made forward. So Member Gaines had made a motion to accept, uh, adopt the order findings uh, presented by the staff and seconded by Ms. Cohen. And I'm going to take roll. Do we, we don't have, did we check with AT&T or we did already? We just did. That mm -hmm. was, okay. Mm -hmm. You had nobody else and, on the line. And just a point of clarification, I know you mentioned in the outset that we had the option of taking all three of these at the same time? Yep. Or one, and I wasn't clear on the motion. Was the motion to approve all three? Yes. Okay. Just for the record. Okay. So Member Gaines had made a motion to um, to adopt the staff recommendation, the order find, to adopt all of the order findings as presented by the staff. And Ms. Cohen, um, Controller Cohen has seconded. I'm going to take the roll. Yes. Chair Vasquez? Aye. Vice Chair Lieber? Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Controller Cohen? Aye. So that's unanimous of all those present here. With that, uh, I'm assuming that was all you had, Ms. Cruz. No, no, no. We've oh, got we a have more. more items. Okay. No, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. All righty. Then we're good. Um, Ms. Cicchetti, if you yes, would call the next uh -huh, item. Yes, we're going to move along here. <laughs> uh, at, uh, if we've taken up all of the items, then... Um, no, we have to be... We're still doing oh, okay. ABC. Okay. ABC all right. I was just like, okay, for a second there. All righty. Now that we're regrouped here, the next item is uh, F2, Land Escaped Assessments. F2, Landscape Assessments, F2A, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, 0135, B, BNSF Railway Company, 0804, C, Los Angeles SMSA Limited Partnership, doing business as Verizon Wireless, 2532, D, Celco Partnership, DBA Verizon Wireless, 2559, AT&T Mobile LLC 2606, and T-Mobile West LLC doing business as T-Mobile 2748. Ms. Dinopoli will present these items for your consideration, which may be voted on individually or collectively. These matters are a constitutional function, therefore Deputy Controller Emron may not participate in accordance with the Government Code Section 7.9. Ms. Dinopoli. 
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable members of the board. I am Pamela Dinopoli, manager of the field appraisal and board role section of the state assessed properties division. Revenue and taxation code 758 allows for addition of assessments to the role that have escaped assessment. I am here this morning to present these land escape assessments for the board's consideration. These items represent property that the assessees failed to report timely and as a result escaped assessment. All six assessees for this agenda item have been notified of the escaped assessments and have been given opportunity to provide additional information to change our escaped assessments. None of the assessees provided any additional, additional information for the escapes that are before you today. Um, and none have communicated any disagreement with the escaped assessments. And I am available for any questions and I ask for the board's adoption of these escaped assessments. I have a question. Member Schaefer has a question, I believe. These escaped assessments, uh, do we look at it as uh, oversight or could there be some intentional to mislead on the part of the taxpayer. Uh, I'm all for forgiving uh, late fees and fines for this is showing a good faith, but as a former prosecuting attorney, I'm also equally interested in holding responsible anybody who might be intentionally uh, misleading us for private gain. Uh, do we ever get into the motives of the taxpayers we deal with? Um, generally speaking, most of the land escape assessments our office deals with are for cell cellular telephone companies. And most cases, typically if they file late, it's because they have such a high volume of um, land changes regarding leased cell sites. We do work closely with the assessees to process these timely. We offer guidance, um, filling out the standard forms if they need assistance. We tend to see um, them file a lot in batches and it's a high volume, so it's kind of um, comes down to the internal processes of the assessees. Um, there does tend to be specific events sometimes, or does not tend to be specific events that cause these late filings. And also with land transactions, they can be filed throughout the year, uh, the occurrence of you know, uh, acquiring land or, or not terminating. And um, some assessees do file at the time of transactions or they file quarterly, and others tend to file with the property statements once a year. So, right. Well, if you ever see something that is uh, not bona fides but malefides, uh, uh, I would like to know about it. So we'd have an option to refer it to the Attorney General's office for uh, considering a prosecution or fines. And if there is uh, just showing a good intent, I think we should always go for the taxpayer because we are taxpayer advocates. Thank you. Welcome. Seeing so you no know other comments, I'd like to entertain a motion to adopt the staff's recommendation. So moved. It's been moved by Member Schaefer. I will second that. We, do we have any written comments on this? We one? have no written comments on this item. Should Let's go it? to the AT&T moderator. All right. AT&T moderator, can you tell us if there's anyone on the line who'd like to make a public comment regarding this item? Certainly, ladies and gentlemen, to make a comment over the phone, <laughs> press one zero, please. And we have no respondents in queue. Thank you. And we've received no nothing in writing. Nothing either. in writing. <laughs> Okay, with that, I guess we'll take a roll call vote. Okay, yeah. Chair Vasquez has made a motion to adopt all escaped assessments as presented by staff, seconded by Mr. Schaefer. I thought it was I think my, it was reversed. Oh, okay. yeah. My motion, yes. Mr. Schaefer, excuse me, I apologize. I didn't my speak loud enough, I'm were, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're going to say that uh, Member Schaefer is the one who made the motion to adopt all escaped assessments as presented by staff, seconded by Chair Vasquez. I'm going to call the roll. Chair Vasquez? Aye. Vice Chair Lieber? Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Controller Cohen? Aye. So that's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with that, we'll move on to our next item. Yeah, the next Spade. item is F, other tax programs, non-appearance matters, F3, board role changes. F3A, 2022 board role of state assessment property. F3B, 2020, 2021, and 2022 board role of private railroad cars. 
Ms. Dinopoli will pre be presenting these items for your consideration, which may be voted on individually or collectively. These matters are a constitutional function. So good morning again. My name is Pamela Dinopoli, um, manager of the field appraisal and board rail section of State Assessed Properties Division. Um, Revenue and Taxation Code Section 4876 allows for correction of errors on the state assessed roll, while Section 11426 allows for correction of assessment errors on the private railroad car roll. I am here to present these three roll changes for the state assessed roll and one roll change for the private railroad car, private railroad car roll for the board's consideration. For the state assessed roll changes, all three changes are to correct staff errors. Uh, the first is to remove an aircraft from the assessment role that had sold prior to the lien date. Um, for the other two role changes, the assessee re had reported they no longer leased a piece of property. Um, it was missed by staff and then the change was made, but the land was removed, but the, the improvements were still being valued. So the assessee notified our office when they realized it and after reviewing our records, we determined that was correct and those should have been removed as well. The private railroad car changes are to correct an assessee reporting error. In this matter, the assessee contacted our office after realizing they had incorrectly included rail cars leased to a different entity on their own property statement reporting, and the assessee provided revised reporting statements which our office reviewed. Um, the role change would correct the assessee's reporting error, and I'm available to answer any questions you have, and I ask you to please consider adoption of these items. If I could. Yes, just Member Gaines. So just for clarification, um, it sounds like in that particular case, the uh, private railroad cars were reported twice. Yes. Okay, because they were leased. Right, so. and so it basically is like a double assessment. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Very well. Thank you. You're welcome. Seeing no other hands or questions. Ms. Chiquetti, do we have any written comments on this one? We have no, no, no one in the audience, but uh, let's see if we could get a motion. I would move staff recommendation. Okay. I second. Okay. All righty. We have no one in the audience who's made a comment on this item, and I have no written comments that have been received. I'm going to go to the AT&T moderator. AT&T moderator, please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding this item. Thank you. Once again, to make comment by phone, press one zero on your phone's keypad at this time. And we have no respondents in queue. All righty, let's see here. Member Vasquez made a motion to adopt all the board role changes as presented by staff, seconded by Mr. Schaefer. I'm going to call roll. Chair Vasquez? Aye. Vice Chair Lieber? Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Controller Cohen? Aye. So that's unanimous of those mm -hmm. present. With that, Ms. Chiquetti, if you would move on to our next item. All righty. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is J, Administrative Consent Agenda, J1, Adoption of the Board Meeting Minutes. Board Meeting Minutes of February 2022, 20, 2023. The meeting minutes are attached to the public agenda for your consideration. Do we have a motion? Move we adopt. It's been moved to adopt the minutes of February 22nd, 2023. Yes. I will second that. I just want to recognize that Ms. Cohen has left the audio and uh, Mr. Emeron has returned. We have no written comments and I have no one in the audience who's made a, a comment on this item. Therefore, we're going to go to the AT&T moderator. AT&T moderator, is there anyone on the line who'd like to make a public comment regarding this matter? Currently, no one in queue wants again to comment on this matter by phone. Press one zero. And with that reprompt, we still have nobody in queue. Okay. 
I have a, I have a question. Uh, we're asking the public for comments on approval of the minutes. Yes. How would they know what the minutes say? Uh, They're attached to the agenda. It's posted. It's posted. Okay. Yes, so they could read them prior. And if they were here and they, what the reading is not what went on, uh, <coughs> they could bring that to our attention. Yes. yes. That's never happened, though. <laughs> Thank you. Alrighty, we have uh, Member Schaefer uh, has moved to adopt the board minutes as presented. Um, uh, Chair Vasquez has seconded. We'll take roll. Chair Vasquez? Aye. Vice Chair Lieber? Aye. Member Gaines? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Deputy Controller Emeron? Aye. That's unanimous to those present. With that, Ms. Chiquetti, if you would call our next item. Mm -hmm. Our next item on the agenda is K, Other Administrative Matters, K-1, Executive Director's Report, K-1A, Organizational Update. This matter will be presented by Ms. Stowers. Good afternoon, Chair Vasquez and honorable members. I am Yvette Stowers, Executive Director. Members, today, for today's report, I will provide a brief update on the Welfare Process Improvement Project. Remind the public that at next month's meeting, it will be the second opportunity for status SEs to participate in our public hearings. I will also highlight the upcoming California Taxpayers Association 97th Annual Meeting and then finally acknowledge the introduction of Assembly Constitutional Amendment ACA 11. Members at last month's meeting, there were some questions on the results of the welfare exemption process improvement project. At that time, I did not have the information at my fingertips. Since then, I have gathered some stats for, from staff to present today. To address your questions, I would like to highlight a few of the achievements of the project. However, I will be brief since staff will present a full report out at the April's board meeting. And I just do not want to steal their, their thunder. Members, as you recall, at the July 27th, 21 meeting, board meeting, the board directed the executive director to start a comprehensive review with the goal of streamlining the application process for the welfare exemption as it relates to affordable housing. Why? Because the board understood that the welfare exemption plays an important role in fostering more affordable housing. Under the board's leadership, staff completed the project and provided a summary at the June 28, 22 board meeting. One area of improvement expansion is the applications, the applicant's ability to electronically submit the required documents. Having electronic submission is in goal and in line with our strategic plan to modernize the property tax program. Another area of process improvement was a review and a revision of the forms to confirm that they had ease of use. Since completion, staff has had the opportunity to, re to review the results of the project. I am pleased to share that they are now seeing total application times decrease by more than 50%. On average, it now takes approximately one month or 30 days to complete a package. That's contingent upon we have a complete package. In addition, I'm happy to report that there are no backlogs. Because of the improvements made, 886 organization clearance certificates and 564 supplemental clearance certificates for the welfare exemptions, for welfare exemption were issued for the 22 year. This is an increase from 2021 of 326 additional organization clearances and 336 additional supplemental clearance certificates. As I mentioned, staff will provide a detailed report at next month's meeting, and I'm looking forward to it. Any questions regarding the Welfare Exemption Improvement Project? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Member Gaines has a question. Yeah, thank you. 
Can you give me the numbers again for the number of applications? Uh, I guess it was last two years ago versus last year. Okay, so um, for the 20, okay, last year, mm -hmm. 886 total. Okay, thank you. Or for 886 organization clearance certificates. Okay. And 564 supplemental clearance certificates. Okay, supplement. Okay. This is an increase compared to 2021. Mm -hmm. For 2021, we issued 326. For 2021, um, our organization clearance certificates was down. We the way they have my notes here, I gotta do the math. Yeah. For 2021, we issued, for 2022, we issued 326 more than what we did in 2021. Thank you, okay, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, and the same thing for um, supplemental. So for all, 2022, yeah. we issued 326 more than what we did in 2021. So almost double. Almost doubled. Okay, all right, great, well I just, I want to thank you again for digging into this because it is something we get a lot of calls on. Absolutely. And um, it's not necessarily the BOE either because sometimes the applications just aren't filled out correctly by the constituent uh, party um, and we have to educate. But um, I know you've been working <laughs> on simplifying the application. So um, it's exactly, I think, what we ought to be doing is making it simple as we can for our constituents. Uh, so that they can uh, get done what they need to get done, especially when it comes to exemptions for nonprofits and the key role that they play. So I'm looking forward to hearing more information next month. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Deputy Controller has a question. Uh, not, not a question, uh, Chairman, oh. but I do have some comments. I just want to thank you, uh, Executive Director Stowers, for bringing this um, forward on the welfare exemption improvement process. It's, a, it's an important work we do here at this agency. So I do applaud you and, and the entire team for your hard work on that and looking forward to a full presentation uh, to this body in April. Thank you. Okay, the next item I would like to talk about is um, the public hearings. Next month at the board meeting, we will have a public hearing for status as property presentation on valuation of status as properties. Pursuant to property tax rule 903, the board provides an opportunity for state assessees and their representatives to discuss the value of their property at, at the value of their property at a public meeting. Each year, the board sets the unitary value at the May board meeting and private railroad values at the July meeting. Prior to setting the values, the board provides two opportunities for public discussion. This would be the second opportunity at the April meeting for state assessees to appear before the board and present information that they may feel affect their value. This discussion may relate to any information that pertains to the valuation of status as property. Presenting at the April meeting allows time for staff and the board to consider information provided in the value calculations. Next member, I would like to highlight upcoming event. Tomorrow, March 23rd, the California Taxpayers Association, Caltax, will have their 97th annual meeting. Members, as you know, the board has been invited to join a panel breakfast with the board. Later that afternoon, I, as executive director, will be participating with leaderships from FTB, CDTFA, and OTA in a roundtable discussion, California tax agencies. Agencies, tax agencies, FTB specializing in income tax, CDTFA specializing in sales tax, and BOE specializing in property tax. Three separate and unique functions. This annual meeting is an excellent opportunity to connect with our stakeholders and we appreciate the opportunity to participate. Finally, members, I would like to acknowledge the introduction of ACA 11. As you are aware, Assembly Members Ting, Erwin, and Petrie Norris have introduced legislation to restructure the BOE. 
Throughout the BOA history, the agency has gone through several minor and significant restructures, including proposals to consolidate or merge with other state departments. However, we can confidently state that this recent proposal is not due to a negative reflection of the critical work that the BOE does for the people of California. Member, members, the proposal is currently in the initial stages of legislation. However, we will continue to update you on the status of the amendments in our weekly ledge reports. In addition, while we monitor the proposal, it is critical that we continue to perform our constitutional, statutory, and oversight functions. And finally, I would like to wish Member Schaefer a very, very happy birthday. Number 85. Thank Number 80. You. I didn't know if you wanted, I knew you wanted me to share a very, very happy 85th <laughs> birthday. That's the oldest constitutional officer in history. In history. Many more. That concludes my presentation. Do you have any questions on any of the other items? Uh, Ms. Stowers, uh, we're invited to the breakfast tomorrow. Are we on any panel and doing the rest of the day, or are we just observers after breakfast? Um, just the breakfast, and after the breakfast, they will ask us to leave the room, and they will have other workshops that we oh. don't participate in. Thank you. Except for the one that I'm doing later on that afternoon. Oh, thank you. I have uh, several questions if nobody does, uh, <clears throat> and it may trigger some others to speak out. But first of all, I want to just thank you for your report, especially on ACA 11 and the many reasons uh, that I personally would like to oppose this and see if there's a consensus from the board. Uh, I'd like to put together a, a formal letter of opposition. Um, and let me just read off some of my uh, comments and remarks and then I'll open it up in case there's other members that want to chime in as well. Um, but, you know, as we engage in this discussion, I personally want our opposition letter to make clear that destroying the elected board will result in three of the worst things you could ever do to a state's 58 county assessors and the people of California. The first one being it would silence their voices in taxation matters and bury them in non-elected bureaucracy. We all know what that's like, how frustrating it is to even reach a live person behind a desk only to get cut off and start all over again. And no elected uh, officer is directly accountable except the president or the governor. The second one is it would destroy the unique oversight structure in our state government in which the elected state controller oversees the elected county auditor, controllers, and tax collectors of the state and the elected board oversees and works together with the county assessors who share the same um, constituents in our respective counties. This elected to elected oversight is the responsive and accountable and should not be replaced with bureaucrats. The third, it would violate and erode public trust in the state and assessors as the California Assessors Association said, the BOE's most important function as an assessment agency requires a vastly different skill set than a tax agency. Unlike CDTFA and FTB, which deal with tax collection and rely on voluntary compliance, the board members are responsible for openly and transparently hiring and addressing assessors' issues and those of local assessment appeals boards and the public. Open access to the board and our transparent and collaborative system builds public trust and increases board deliberation and collaboration on a wide variety of policies and standards for real and personal property assessment exemptions, AAB of hearings processes, key taxpayer concerns, and many other issues. And with that, I'll open it up, and I'll, I guess I could start with our Vice Chair, Ms. Lieber, if she has any thoughts or ideas on this before we move forward. Well, I am not sure if I see Mr. Nanjo rising to make a comment <laughs> at this time, um, but I, I wonder if uh, uh, we would need to have that agendized to take a position on um, and 
if necessary, we could uh, agendize the next month if it's uh, still relevant at that time. Um, the executive director's report under the PAN allows you to take action. So uh, since this is part of the report, this is an appropriate um, follow-on to the executive director's report. Um, so at this point, you do have the option to um, do as the chairman suggests. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for checking. Thank you. And um, I've obviously been watching this piece of legislation with uh, keen interest and um, I, I do have a concern uh, anytime there's uh, a movement to take away elected representation um, from Californians. I know that my colleagues will have their own comments, um, but I also wanted to add my kudos <coughs> on the streamlining of the uh, welfare exemption uh, process, and I think that um, moving completed applications through the process in, in 30 days is really commendable and uh, shows the uh, functionality and need that there is uh, for the work of the BOE. Thank you. And I see a comment, a hand here on from Member Gaines. Yeah, well. thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I do think we should uh, take action in um, opposition to ACA 11. <clears throat> we are the taxpayer advocate. We are the electeds that represent constituents that have issues with government. <clears throat> and we have a, a position within this agency uh, called the taxpayer rights advocate. But we have the interface because we are electeds and therefore have the ability to provide oversight in terms of how the agency is run <clears throat> and also be a conduit uh, for challenges that our constituents have. And we've received hundreds of calls and letters and all sorts of inquiries that were tax related, probably thousands actually. Uh, if we take a look at the agency itself and how it's functioned um, during our tenure, um, we have been accountable, we have been transparent and the agency is running really well. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what has happened here. And of course, we had the implementation of Prop 19. And we were charged with the, adu the duty of implementing that. Whether you <coughs> like that initiative or not, it was passed by the people. And as a result, we were responsible for implementing it. We, again, has acted, have acted as that conduit, as electeds on the implementation of Prop 19 with over 400,000 hits on our website and thousands of inquiries over the, the phone and via email to each of our offices. And I would argue that the duties of the BOE ought to be restored. Uh, duties were taken away uh, with um, AB 102 and uh, not, not fully, I would target it. I think there's an opportunity to take a look at uh, appeal cases for smaller businesses when it comes to sales and use, that they would have a voice, that they would get to make uh, an appeal to their peers, uh, electeds representing them as constituents. And um, it was interesting, because I spoke to George Runner when he served in this capacity on the Board of Equalization. I said, George, you know, you had these appeals coming before you. Uh, tell me, how many cases would you overturn? He said, maybe one in 10. So it wasn't like the floodgates were opening. They were simply looking at the cases and the merits of the case and as to whether there should be some sort of accommodation or not. And so um, I'm fully in support of our efforts here to um, come up with a resolution. So thank you. Before I <coughs> move forward with uh, at least seeing if there's a consensus on this board, uh, I want to ask Ms. Stowers a, a quick question. Do we know what is the BOE's actual estimate of savings, you know, for the taxpayers as we, you know, we we're constantly hearing from, well, I guess ACA 11 kind of brings that out saying, you know, what, what's the, the buying power or 
uh, the real function of the BOE as I was listening to this hearing that just took place, uh, I believe it was a couple days ago. Thank you, um, Chair Vasquez, for that question. I also listened to the presser, I believe it was yesterday, and one of the authors indicated that um, eliminating the Board of Equalization could result in 32 million, so somewhere between 27 million to 32 million dollars in savings. Um, I would say this, that um, as you know, our proposed budget for the 23-24 year is 32 million dollars, which is very similar to our current budget. And of that $32 million, 95% of it is for salary for permanent silver, civil servant staff, the staff, the property tax experts of the BOE. So 5% savings of the $32 million, I would say. And 32, I think, comes out to, I believe it's like one-third of 1%. Yes. Of the total budget, which is like I, I believe it's we're up to around seventy nine billion dollars. Oh, the, the total state. budget. The yes. total budget, yes. right? It's total state budget. Yes. Total state budget. Yes. Well, with that, I'll I'll turn it. Oh, Member Schaefer, yes, go ahead. Um, it's nice that we have uh, good positions to present, but it, they might have more credibility if we had somebody like uh, the Sacramento Bee filing a statement on our defense or the California Taxpayers Association, some entity that's not us that might have a little more credibility, uh, might pick up the interest of Associated Press or somebody like that because we're really trying to get the attention of uh, 80 uh, assembly members and 40 uh, senators and uh, they're not gonna pay as much attention to what we have to say about saving our, our own uh, position here as they would have if they'd have a independent analysis of California t taxpayers or some media source. Uh, you know, it's the big issue. It's very important that we have elected official making these decisions rather than more bureaucrats. Uh, these chairs would be filled by appointees of Governor Newsom under any other situation and we represent no, not Governor Newsom, but we represent our own 10 million people scattered throughout the state. And uh, I think that uh, being brought home by us is like a defense attorney talking. He's obviously motivated for his client. But the same case can equally be made by some independent entity, media or organizational, that might love us as much as we love ourselves. And uh, I would be all for uh, bringing them into the fold if we can identify somebody that might uh, share our, our views because it's that important. Thank, Thank you for you. that comment, Member Schaefer. Um, we do have, there are many who share our views, and the California Taxpayers Association is already on the record opposing ACA 11. And, and if we can shave that 32 million down to, uh, you know, 27 million or something, uh, mm -hmm. by a little belt tightening, uh, I know I'm yeah. asked to hire an extra person uh, to show the importance of our office, and actually the, Members that we do have are tightening our belt and working a little harder and uh, saving that uh, $100,000 here and there. Uh, uh, I'm all for reducing our uh, budget a little bit. I think that would get the uh, applause of some of the media. Ex I, I thank you, sir. We are very efficient. And um, over the years since 2017, we've done a great deal to reduce our costs in, 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 in some very um, key areas. Mm. And for example, our office spaces, we have reduced that dramatically across the board, all of you guys. So we, 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 we are concerned, we take note of how we are spending the taxpayer dollars. Yeah. I understand I have an office in downtown San Diego, which my staff and I we are working, use yes, very much. We yeah, have a very nice office there, sir. And we are working to arrange for that office, for your your district office, to be at a, a better area for you. Yes, and I think at, we at a, at, a, at, a, at a continued reduced rate. Yeah, so we can we figure are we get a quite a savings. I think is possible too. Yes. yes. Thank you, Vice Chair Lieber. I believe has another question. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I, I would like to have our uh, communications to the legislature. Uh, 
include um, the concern about uh, that the other agencies lack in property tax staffing and that uh, the permanent civil service staff of the BOE would under their proposal would need to be transferred and that there would be a period of time and cost for integration of that staff into other agencies and um, the impact that that would have on uh, taxpayers and in particular uh, the entities that Mr. Gaines mentioned in terms of small business and uh, in individuals, families, especially the families uh, who have a family member with a disability who are concerned about the implementation of Prop 19 and have time dependent issues that they need to be answered. And um, also the uh, concern about the, uh, the elimination of a venue for taxpayers uh, to come to and uh, interact with uh, elected representation um, and our interface with the uh, county assessors in terms of, as Mr. Gaines said, um, an elected to elected uh, relationship and, and responsiveness. Um, I think that those are, those are key things that I have not seen reflected in ACA 11 uh, in any way, shape, or form. And, and I think the to my mind, the savings are not really there in ACA 11, but there's no recognition of the cost of the churn of uh, a, a restructuring and a removal of accountability and representation. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> if not, if, the, if, um, if there's a consensus on this board, I will move forward to putting together, and I'll work with our executive director on this, a, a formal uh, letter that would go out in opposition to AC 11, and then uh, if everybody's comfortable with it, we'll, we'll get it out, we'll send it out. Because I know several of the tax groups that I have had uh, some interaction with, like you mentioned, some of them have already put out letters, and they were asking for any other information that we can gather that would be <coughs> helpful to them, and I'm hoping this uh, our position also would shed a little bit of light for them to take and run with it as well. And in talking to some of the legislators, they were kind of appalled that this was even being introduced. <coughs> so hopefully this will help as it's moving forward through the process. And Chair, uh, and this is not a partisan issue. It's no, it isn't. Matter of fact, I've received, uh, co I've had calls and actually conversations with folks from the Republican Party and a lot of the folks that are active, especially in the tax groups, are from the Republicans as well as Democrats. So it's, I would think it's the Republicans would be our biggest fans. I think so too. Um, uh, excuse me, um, Chair Vasquez. I'm sorry. Um, the president of the CAA is in the audience. Um, she would like to speak on this matter. Oh yes, come on up. <coughs> Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Christine Lee, Kings County Assessor and President of the California Assessors Organi Association. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak for a moment. The Assessors Association hasn't had a chance to take a position on AC 11, um, but as the Kings County Assessor, um, I am in opposition of it personally. There's so much value in the Board of Equalization you know, you were saying 32 million possibly in expense. That's, you know, maybe half a million per county. And then if you break it down by constituent, it's, it's basically pennies. So your value, your board's value, the staff's value to the assessors is um, just, there, there's so many different ways. Uh, one is the surveys that you do that allows us to make sure that we're all on course and kind of staying standard with um, the objectives of carrying out the revenue and taxation code. There's also guidance and the ability for the assessors to reach out and ask questions. Um, you know, sometimes such as Prop 19, when things come about, we, we can ask each other, but 
we do need some sort of um, guidance sometimes to make sure we're all on the same path and we're doing what's best for the taxpayers and property owners of this state. So um, I would definitely say it's something that should never be done away with, and at least not in my lifetime. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I think we might have a question here for Mr. Schaefer. Oh, Madam Schaefer. President, uh, uh, obviously you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Uh, I would like you to put the same uh, energy and charm into talking to the publishers of any publication in your county, uh, definitely to the legislators, even the local board of supervisors and city council type people, because they're opinion leaders too. Uh, they would be flattered to have your attention, and I would hope you'd find time to give it. I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Lee. I'm sure you agree with that. Any, if there's no other comments on this, uh, it sounds like I'm hearing and filling a consensus here. So we will go to, I will go ahead and move forward on that. Yes, and sir. You thank you all. My office will, I will reach out to you when we get, and we'll, uh, get the letter drafted and reviewed thank you okay. <coughs> with that I, that's did all you that I have to report mm -hmm. unless that, you have more for me unless we have other questions of Miss Dowers seeing no other hands Miss Chiquetti I thank guess thank you for the birthday wishes mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> the next item on the agenda is k1 executive director's report k1b operational priorities report presented by Miss Renati <coughs> welcome thank you so good morning, Chairman Vasquez and honorable members. My name is Lisa Renati. I'm the Chief Deputy Director. Uh, today I'll report on some of the agency's operational priorities and projects. The first item is workforce planning. Uh, over the past three years, the agency has continued to address and align our current and future needs through comprehensive workforce planning. This has included analyzing and forecasting our current and future for workforce needs, assessing and addressing gaps, and creating strategies for retaining and attracting talent to ensure we have the right people with the right skills in the right places to fill our const constitutional and statutory <coughs> mandates. Our workforce planning it has been including the initiation of a formal classification study of our current appraiser and auditor appraiser classifications. We are exploring and have made a request for approval to use alternate classifications to aid in the recruitment of quality candidates. We have realigned our management to better facilitate workforce coverage. We are actively uh, participating in knowledge transfer activities to preserve and pass on our expert institutional property tax knowledge. We are mitigating the effect of our workload uh, due to retirement of managers and staff through rotational assignments. We are augmenting our recruitment approaches and we're also analyzing the impact of generational, difference, gener generational differences in mindsets in our workplace. So at BOE, um, in, well, in general, in 2019, millennials uh, overtook baby boomers as America's largest generation. However, at BOE, our generational workforce diversity includes 30% baby boomers, 44% Generation X, 23% millennials, and 3% Generation Zs. Those Generation Zs are age 28 to 11. Well, we don't have any 11-year-olds, but age 28 is the higher old. Um, not, not yet, no 11-year-olds yet. So. With four generations that currently make up the BOE workforce, it's important for managers and leaders to understand how these different generations view work, their values and preferences, and what motivates them. Um, understanding these differences is crucial in attracting and retaining the right talent. For example, in general, because there's no absolutes, uh, younger generations value flexibility, inclusivity, work-life work balance, and purpose-driven work, while our older generations view stability, security, and a clear career path. Understanding and accommodating these differences has assisted us in attracting and retaining these talented professionals. Since our last meeting, we have filled five vacant positions. One is a promotion of an internal candidate, and the other four are employees new to the BOE. I commend our supervisors and managers for continuing to recruit and fill all vacant positions to ensure our workforce capacity is solidly in place. The next item is a status on our IT modernization project. A request for information, referred to as an RFI, was released to the public on January 24th with a deadline of February 22nd to reply. Our RFA, RFI, cannot speak today, aimed to collect information from interested technology vendors to design, develop, and implement a new board role system 
and a workload and case management system for the agency. We are pleased to receive multiple responses and we are reviewing the information to determine our next steps. Uh, this concludes my report on operational priorities and I welcome any questions you may have. I have a question. Yes. <coughs> yeah. One question here so far from Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, Ms. Renati, I don't want us to feel that we have to fill any vacancy that comes along. Uh, you know, I've spoken to a little belt tightening to make us maybe a little more efficient. Uh, I know there's been pressure on me to fill some vacancies uh, that, uh, like <clears throat> we lost Miss Miss Blake, who's my chief counsel after uh, 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 tw 20 years of service to the state or so. Uh, we've been able to tighten our belts and save a few bucks by not replacing her. Uh, and we do have the great uh, services of our chief counsel when we need a little assistance. So I'd like to speak up for uh, <clears throat> some position that you may not be able to fill, I don't want you to feel bad about it. Thank you. I just had a quick question, you know, in, in light of now that it's out there, the AC-11, do you feel that's had any kind of an impact on your recruitment? Well, you know, as you know, it was recently introduced, um, and but we anticipate it will have an impact our recruitments and have a negative impact on that recruitment, yes. If I could just clarify. Um, Go ahead, Member Gaines. Yeah, with the passage of uh, AB 102, uh, the BOE really had to be kind of reorganized. And so there was a huge split uh, of staffing. Uh, we had to rebuild our whole legal department. Uh, we had property uh, folks that I think, well, we had a split. I, I should probably not get real specific, but we it's taken us, I think, about this much time just yeah. to get it back to where it needs to be. And um, and then in addition to that, we've had to take on the responsibility of implementing Prop 19. And we've done that without asking for any additional staffing, uh, just trying to fill some of these vacancies. So I wanna make sure that we have the right balance of uh, having the right staffing to get the jo job done right versus having not enough staffing and everybody being pressured and becoming actually less efficient. So there's a balance there. And uh, I think we've had the right balance and we're starting to fill those positions that should be filled. Uh, we're seeing great progress in terms of our classes that we're offering to county assessors and, uh, and their staff uh, and using technology to do that. So I'm. I'm excited about where we are and the progress that we've made and uh, in being careful, obviously careful uh, with our budget, but uh, I think we're at about the same as we were last year. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're asking for more, but I wanna make sure we run it right too. I agree yeah. completely. Right. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, I think we're good. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is K2A <clears throat> Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office Report. This matter will be presented by Ms. Thompson. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Vasquez and honorable board members. I'm Lisa Thompson, the Chief of the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office, and I'm here to provide you with an update on the activities of the TRA office um, to keep you informed. First, I'm pleased to report some statistics from um, last month as far as the completed cases by our office uh, and provide some insight on the type of those cases. <coughs> Figures are provided by board member district, by category, administrative versus valuation, and by topic areas within those categories in a memorandum attached to the public agenda notice. Um, I'm just going to go over some of those statistics for you today. In February, we completed 32 cases. Eight were in board member Keynes' district, District 1. Six were in board member Lieber's district, District 2. 10 were in board member Vasquez's district, District 3. And eight were in board member Schaefer's district, District 4. Of the 32 completed cases, three were in the administrative category and 29 were in the valuation category. The administrative category includes topics such as creating mailing of tax bills, refunds, penalty cancellations, defaulted taxes, access to data, special assessments, or direct levies on the tax bill. 
valuation category includes change in ownership, declines in value, appraisal methodology, exclusions, exemptions, actual enrollment of value, general property taxation, and assessment appeals. With respect to the administrative category and three uh, cases in total, they all pertain to delinquent or defaulted property taxes. With respect to the valuation category and its 29 cases in total, eight pertain to change in ownership, 12 pertain to exclusions from reassessment, five cases involved um, exemptions, three cases involved property taxation, and one new construction. To provide some additional insight on the specific types of exclusion and exemption cases, I offer this further breakdown. For the 12 cases involving exclusions from reassessment, nine pertain to the parent-child exclusion, and three pertain to base or value transfers for persons age 55 and over. Nine of the 12 cases occurred during the time of current law under Proposition 19. Well, um, the changes in ownership events occurred on or after the February 16, 2021 effective date of the uh, Proposition 19's intergenerational transfer exclusion provisions. And the remaining cases uh, pertain to transfers occurring under prior law. For the five exemption cases, two pertain to the disabled veterans exemption, one pertain to the 4% uh, vessel exemption, and two pertain to the welfare exemption. To provide some additional insight on the type of the case uh, that we have to assist taxpayers, I wanted to offer some additional information on one case as an example of how we helped a taxpayer to resolve their uh, concerns. This case involved a nonprofit organization that was seeking exemption on uh, one property um, that its uh, sister nonprofit organization had transferred it to it so it would be separate from the other organization in order to receive certain grants and to two other properties that the organization uh, had purchased thereafter. The organization was seeking the welfare exemption available under <coughs> property taxes for property used for domestic violence shelters and transitional housing. Both organizations were nonprofit organizations, but the corporation was formed to uh, that was formed to receive the properties from the other corporation was granted IRS tax exempt status under IRC 501c2. The assessor's office where the properties were located explained that its office could not grant the welfare exemption until that uh, new organization held a valid organizational clearance certificate issued by our agency. The new for formally, newly formed organization then applied for an organizational clearance certificate with our agency, but was, was surprised when it received an incomplete finding sheet without being an issued an o OCC. Um, because the properties were operated similarly to the sister organization, um, the organization didn't understand why the finding sheet had uh, asked for an IRS tax exempt letter under 501c3, so it just continued to submit the same uh, IRS tax exempt letter, although it was under a different code. Um, the organization didn't make the connection that the IRS code was different. Um, after a few submissions, the taxpayer um, contacted the Taxpayer Rights Advocate Office and we helped them understand that the newly formed organization would never receive an organizational clearance certificate if the organization only held the 501c2 status uh, because IRS 501c1 was needed. We helped them to understand that the law only allows certain types of organizations, nonprofit organizations, to qualify for the welfare exemption, um, and that um, for other organizations, such as a limited liability company, uh, where its members needed to have 501c3 status, that was acceptable, um, and also for limited partnerships um, that op own and operate low-income housing properties, although they themselves um, were are not nonprofit 501c3 or nonprofit at all, um, they are permitted to have the welfare exemption under a law um, allowing for uh, for it if they have a nonprofit managing general partner. So thereafter, the organization engaged its attorney uh, to apply for the IRS to change its IRS status uh, from 501c2 to 501c3. And after a long journey, it received uh, 501c3 status 
and contacted our office uh, seeking assistance with it receiving an organizational clearance certificate. Um, and uh, we contacted the uh, agency's property tax department in the exec exemption section um, to uh, ensure that that claim was expedited for them, um, as well as offered to contact the assessor's office to see if their claim could be expedited um, for the past few years that it was unable to receive the welfare exemption on those domestic uh, violent shelters. Finally, um, uh, we were able to coordinate with the assessor's office and uh, get that exemption granted. The next item that I would like to report on is follow-up questions posed from last uh, month's meeting by Member Schaefer. Um, during the um, presentation of the taxpayers' um, annual, um, annual report, uh, Member Schaefer asked what the pictures on the cover to that report was. At that time, um, I said that the pictures were basically represented of each district, uh, but I was not able to indicate what exactly what those us were, so I have that information for you now. So in case you don't have it with you, those are the pictures. Um, so for the 2021-22 TRA annual report, the photos on the front cover actually go clockwise in order from the top left picture, starting with District 1, with the picture on the top right from District 2, the picture on the bottom right from District 3, and the picture on the bottom left from District 4. The top photo from uh, District 1 is the Auburn City Hall. Uh, it is also the Placer County Historic Courthouse in Auburn, California, that was completed in 1898. And it it's is also- building, by the way. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah. If you're it's, ever in Auburn, Check it out. It's they did a great job in renovating it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is lovely, um, and um, it is also home of the Placer County Museum. So the next one from uh, District One, which is on the top left photo, um, it. I'm sorry, sorry. District the the top right photo is from District Two. Is the um, Berkeley Tower located on UC Berkeley campus with the San Francisco Bay in the background? Uh, one of my staff members actually graduated from UC Berkeley, and she refers to it as the uh, Campanelli, also known as the uh, Sather Tower. Uh, and a Campanelli is a Italian bell tower. Hopefully I'm not, not mis mispronouncing that. I took French. Um, so the uh, bottom right photo from District 3 is the Pasadena City Hall, specifically the back side of the building on Euclid Avenue. Um, the bottom left photo from, dis from District 4 is the San Diego waterfront, specifically the marina and waterfront at the Embarcadero in San Diego. So uh, at future board meetings, I will be providing further updates to keep you informed on the activities of the TRA. Well, you've done office. a very good job on those pictures. I'm impressed with all four of them. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> they are actually all very nice. I can't take credit for them. I just give broad, you know, requests to our forms and publication sections that picks the photos. So. But I do like bridges and water. <laughs> so, I'm happy to ask, yeah. ask, answer any questions if you have any. There is, it looks like we do have some. I'll start with Member Gaines first. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and. Um, how many cases are being dealt with in each county, excuse me, each district that we have. Uh, but I, I met with a constituent uh, earlier this week that was having a challenge with um, a, a home that they had sold and they bought a, a new home in a, in a different county. It was a base year value issue and it was taking a long time uh, to get the new county to go through and process the paperwork. It's a problem that we've had throughout all of our districts. And uh, in the meantime, they're having to pay a higher tax base. Uh, is there anything that we can do um, at the BOE to provide um, a seminar or um, an, uh, some sort of education process in terms of how that should be determined? In this particular case, the constituent um, said that they didn't really understand uh, how to go through the proper paperwork. And um, again, in this case, it's been two years, so they're really struggling. 
I haven't presented it to anybody at the BOE because I suggested that the constituent talk to their county assessor who's newly elected and see if they can get, get it done quickly. But um, I'll be in communication uh, with her and if she has an issue, maybe <coughs> asking you or others at the BOE to see if there's anything that we can do to, to help them. My, part of my question is, are, are the county assessor staff uh, properly trained on this base year value issue, uh, do they understand it, or is it is it just a labor issue and there's backlogs? I, it's probably a combination in some counties, but um, it's something that keeps coming up. Um, it's something that we we've had to implement here at the BOE Prop 19, but we want to make sure that it's operating smoothly. And I noticed that uh, Sister Lee is not here. But uh, certainly we ought to be communicating with them, I think, in terms of how to resolve this. So um, if you know, you'd like to forward that over to uh, my office, I'm happy to take a look at it and contact her, look at the specific situation. Yeah. Um, but I do think, I mean, county uh, assessor staff are definitely trained on um, understanding how to process base your value transfers. Um, you know, there was a time period that um, where basically um, the implementing legislation was not passed for a time period that okay. has has passed since September of 2021 okay. so that's ample time to do that but it's volume I think different counties are staffed differently um, but there were a lot of base your value transfers that were made particularly uh, with the change in law now where a uh, person can move anywhere in the state as opposed to previously um, under prior law you could only move to um, a different county if that county adopted an ordinance allowing such base year value transfer, mm -hmm. and there were only 10 in the state. That's right. So, um, and with Proposition 19 allowing you to buy up higher market value, people are doing it. So there's a huge volume. Um, it also takes additional time to process when, uh, when you move from one county to another, mm -hmm. because um, part of uh, determining a new base year value is looking at what uh, the factored base year value was of mm -hmm. the prior um, of the previous property original property yeah, so, um, that's that, been, so they wouldn't case, know that's it. been provided so the county yeah. they moved from did do the <coughs> paperwork it's yes. the new county that they've moved to yeah that's delayed it for about two years and that's mm -hmm. just a Oh, okay. Um, yeah I can take a look at I'm happy okay. to take a, a look at it but yeah that's I think yeah, I mean, they have to provide that factor base your value. And also the new assessor has to, uh, the new county um, has to actually calculate the new base your value. But okay. I'm happy to look into, um, okay. you know, what the reasoning of, is of that and get back to your I'll office. See if, yeah, I'll see if our constituent is successful in meeting with the assessor. And then next step, we'll give you a call. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. May I suggest we had uh, implied earlier today when we had the telephone caller in that we would take an item up around 1130. So we're going to take something out of order, if that's okay with you. Sure. So we're going to go to uh, item K, Legislative Research and Statistics Division Chief's Report, K5A, Legislative Issues. This item will be presented by Ms. Renati, and then we will return and do the property tax report later or we'll see <laughs> when appropriate as time yes. as time allows thank you so chairman vasquez and honorable, honorable members i am lisa renati chief of D deputy director and today i'll provide a brief report on behalf of the legislative research and statistics division attached to today's agenda is a listing of bills we are tracking and monitoring so that the that could impact the boe's tax programs or administration for our tax programs, we are in process of preparing analysis for four bills relating to affordable housing, two bills relating to base year transfers for disasters, one bill extending the exemption for qualified property used in space flight, one bill regarding disclosure of alcoholic beverage tax returns for beer manufacturers, and a bill related to homeowners exemption for persons confined in a hospital or other care facility, and five bills relating to exemptions available for disabled veterans. As we complete bill analyses for these items, we will post the analyses on our website and provide a copy to your offices for your reference. 
Additionally, we continue to track the three board-sponsored legislative proposals approved by the board in November 2022. Um, SB 890 makes technical changes, clarifying the changes made by Prop 19 and Senate Bill 539 to amend the Revenue and Taxation Code to include references relating to the intergenerational transfer exclusion and the age 55 and older and disabled and disaster-based year transfers. SB 889 makes technical changes affecting the alcoholic beverage tax to increase the efficiency and administration of the program concerning the authorization of electronic service of levies and the amendment of the RNT, RTC code to require any determinations or cancellations that are in excess of 50,000 to be public uh, for 10 days after the effective date of the determination or cancellation. Members, this concludes my report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a couple of questions if nobody else has any, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if it's a, a question for you or Mr. Young, I see him in the back as well, and it's regards to SB 653, the Senator Archuleta's bill, mm -hmm. which you mentioned. It says, although the language is not at it yet, it appears that it would allow individuals to claim both the homeowner's exemption and the veteran's exemption. Is that correct? The way the bill is currently written, correct, it does allow both. Yes. The way, well, I. Well, it hasn't been amended yet, but based, amended, that's the but intent it, of the bill as written. But as it's, as it's moving forward, that's what I'm hearing, and that's what I was wondering if you had any updates on that, or, or I guess it's more of a legal question, if that's something. Well, I can answer. I'm going to try to answer. And okay. Dave, Dave said he's going to run up if I say something crazy, but I, right. I, it has. we're waiting for it to be amended. Okay. But based on uh, current statutes, the exemptions are mutually exclusive. So, um, so right, as, as it stands right now, those are mutually exclusive. You claim one or the other. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So depending on, well, I guess we still have to wait. To see, let's see what the language comes out. But so that's, that was kind of my reading, and I think you answered my question on that one. Um, the, as, I think you also touched on AB 1014. Was that correct? Or you're going to get to that one? No, I think I put that on there. That was one of the ones we're, we're working on, yes. <clears throat> on that one, uh, kind of another one, it combines disabled veterans, the exemption with any other real property exemption, including regular veterans exemptions. Do we have data indicating how many uh, claimants uh, have received this disabled veterans exemption? I don't have it at my fingertips. We okay. are, I, I believe we do have it and we can we circle do. back with your office and give, get you that information. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I well, okay. no, I guess yeah, I'll wait for that. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Seeing no other hands, I think we're good. All right, Ms. Ranavi, can you oh. please stay for a second here? Yes, oh, we have that one mm -hmm. member yes. of the public. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a statement that we have no one in the audience who wanted to make a public comment regarding this item. Uh, I'm going to go to the AT&T moderator, uh, but we do have two written comments on this item that Ms. Renati will read into the record. So let's go out to the AT&T moderator. AT&T moderator, do we have anyone on the line who'd like to make a public comment regarding this matter? Uh, again, if you'd like to make comment and have not already done so, press one zero on your phone's keypad. We will go first to Janine Kilroy. Kilroy, please go ahead. And I apologize. Mine is actually relative to SCA four and now ACA eleven. Should I go back in queue or speak now? I believe you could do it now. Okay, great. So um, my name is Janine Kilroy, and I want to thank you for letting us comment. I, I came out to the meeting last summer regarding Proposition 19 and the damage it start, has already started to cause our state, many families, and the systematic elimination of our only under-market rental units in the state where many school teachers and plumbers, et cetera, live that are now being eliminated because of 19. And while I was originally here to ask for your guidance on how we get SCA4 on the agenda of the Senate committees, um, as there was an, a, a meeting yesterday of the Elections and Constitutional Amendment uh, group, but it was not on that agenda. I'm very politically naive, so I would love to get some feedback. But before we go into that, I would like to emphasize my strong opposition of the possibility of the elimination of this board via this AC11, ACA11 you mentioned 
it genuinely makes me sick that someone would bring this forward. It feels like we're being suffocated and we don't have a path to speak and reach out to people. It's very, very weird for a, a democracy to me. So sorry to sound passionate, but it is very disturbing to me. Uh, if I didn't have a very full-time job, I'd offer to help your, the cause here and try to get the attention of a paper of just how evil uh, a move this seems to me. Uh, with that said, I'd appreciate hearing about any ideas on how we can get more attention um, about the importance of SC, uh, A4 to gain awareness, to get this adopted. I don't know if we as citizens and taxpayers can submit agenda items to these other groups or how best to go about getting attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, on the question of uh, getting information, do we, we have, I guess we can get back to on some of the groups that are out there and the process, I guess. It sounds like she needs some assistance or guidance in terms of how to get in her positions maybe uh, heard with different groups that we are, at least that we're informed with. And I don't know if Ms. Renati, if you're, well, I know you're kind of new in this role, so I'm not sure if it's uh, something that uh, you're familiar with. And I see uh, our attorney walking up, so I guess he's going to fill me in a little bit on this one. So uh, thank you, Chairman Vasquez, and thanks to um, the caller. I'm Henry Nancho, Chief Counsel here. Um, first and foremost, she should go to her um, representative. Um, that's generally a first stop. Um, the re representative's office can give her information on, uh, obviously she can make her position known to that representative and um, she could uh, provide input that way. In addition, um, you know, a, the legislature has their website. They usually post things, um, especially hearings, and most of their hearings allow a period for public comment, as the board members know. That's another good source for the um, caller to provide input. Um, generally speaking, her legislative um, person should be able to help, and then if she wants to contact our TRA office or our staff, we can get her contact information and possibly reach out with more assistance. Could I add to that? Yes, go ahead, yeah, Member Gaines. I really appreciate uh, Ms. Kilroy's comments, and um, I just want to drill a little bit more on the um, her representative, so she could... I, I would advise that she call her assembly member and uh, senator and just voice her opposition uh, to ACA 11 and then also ask for information on the bill. Also, uh, SCA 4, I think, is the other one she mentioned, but she should be able to get um, some information about the aspects of that bill and they could keep her on a list and keep her informed in terms of what's happening, the progress uh, or defeat of that legislation as it moves forward. So. Absolutely. Thank you, Member Gaines. Thank you. Thank you, Board Members. And I believe uh, our Vice Chair, Ms. Lieber, has something to add to that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, um, I wanted to point out also to the caller, hopefully um, Ms. Kilroy is still listening, that uh, through either the Assembly or Senate's uh, websites, you can look at the bills that are being considered. And when you go to a specific bill like SCA 4, you can subscribe to that bill by uh, email, entering your email address, and then you'll be automatically notified when there are any changes to the bill, when the bill is referred to a committee. And so it's a really great way to really start to track that through the process. And um, so I, I would encourage everyone to do that with the bills that they're interested in. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Seeing no other hands or comments. We have someone else on the line. We do have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep, we do have uh, one more in queue. We will welcome back Christine Huey. Please go ahead. Oh, there you go. You, you're alive now. Go ahead, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for hearing me out. My name is Christine Huey. I am also calling uh, in support of AC, uh, 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 A4, uh, which Jen was calling about, Jen Kilroy. Um, I think we really need to uh, reverse that part of the legislation of, of Prop 19 uh, that was quite deceitful. Um, I mean, there's nothing in the title 
that shows the true nature of the bill, uh, which is actually a death tax. I mean, who doesn't want to help the elderly or the burn victims or the disabled? Everyone does. But uh, when I first read the piece of legislation, um, that part where it reassesses the property tax for those who are already in mourning of the death of their parents or grandparents, I mean, that's just not right. So I do want to gain support for that, that bill, and I, I'm wondering also how we can go about to get support for it. I appreciate your comments, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, ourselves, you know, we've pretty much uh, dealt with it quite a bit and with some hearings, and, and I think we also share some of your frustrations. Uh, I think probably the best thing to do, I'm not sure in what district you're in, but uh, getting a hold of your uh, senator and assembly member in your district, I think would be a good start. Thank you, but we can't seem to get any support. And when I when I was collecting signatures, when I talked to people about it, they didn't know anything about it. There's absolutely no information, or no one knows anything, and it's just been really, really hard because this is going to affect a lot of people in California, and they just don't realize it yet. No, I agree. Uh, Member Gaines, I think, has a comment. Uh, just well. the. Yeah, I, w I would talk to your legislators, uh, see if you could follow the legislation uh, that you're concerned about, as was suggested uh, by Member Lieber. Um, on Prop 19, you, I, I would call Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, and they could give you an update of what's going on, because there's been talk about putting an initiative on the ballot uh, to make changes to Prop 19, and I, I just don't know if that's if it's really going to move forward or not, but um, they could give you oh, I think, yeah, they could I, give you information. I think that they did they did come up with the um, that the uh, prop uh, the uh, uh, information on trying to reverse that part of the Prop 19, but we're trying to move it for and we can't seem to get. I mean, it's it's just dying. I, I don't want to see it die without a chance. So we need someone to help us move it along, and yeah. we don't know how to yeah. go about it. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would still say that I, I would at least speak to them and find out if they're planning to do anything in that area on Prop 19 because it, it, I think it's on their list of issues to look at. I just don't know if they're moving forward or not. It's, it's a very expensive process to move through an initiative um, in terms of you've got to raise money, you've got to gather <laughs> signatures. Um, you know, a lot of them fail. Um, but um, it's at least a, an avenue uh, that is available to um, citizens in the state of California. So um, that's just, just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Do we have anybody else on the line? Yeah, we do. Oh. We have one more in queue. Okay. We're going to go to Ty Louie. Ty Louie, please go ahead. Hey, Louie. Hi, this is Gina C. Louie. I guess ACA 11 must be a very bad, unlucky number because that was the same number for 2020 Proposition 19. <laughs> and now it's, it's trying to get rid of the Board of Equalizations that has been the only taxpayer advocate that is willing to hear us. Uh, Christine was on earlier. Jen was on earlier. And you guys take the complaints for Proposition 19. And what, what we're asking, because we know that you just enact whatever is voted on taxpayer-wise, legislation-wise, et cetera, is that when you do have people that are complaining to you, let them know that we exist. We have tried on F FCA 4 yesterday to contact one of the two committees that it was referred to, and there was no it wasn't on their agenda. And that's really disappointing because they're referred, and supposedly we're going to get a hearing uh, April 6th, and the next one for the second committee is going to be March 29th. So how do we get heard if our legislators don't want to hear us? Unfortunately, we've reached out to Phil Ting, 
Scott Wiener, and they're for Prop 19. So they're just, you know, they're not for the people. How do we get something for the people? Well, I, I guess my only thoughts is that uh, you're right. I guess at the end of the day, I mean, you started off in the right direction, I think, just reaching out to your representatives. Uh, and actually, in 24, you'll have an opportunity to vote for a new representative because Ting is actually turned out. So there will be an opportunity for you to think about uh, voting for somebody that's going to listen to you. Can I just yes, add in? Because I, I think it's just a matter of being active and engaged, and you know, you could develop a coalition of support, uh, you know, volunteers, and you could follow the bill uh, and get. Um, you should be able to get accurate information because these are public hearings. So, whenever it's uh, appearing before a committee, uh, you should be able to get the date and time of that, and there's always an opportunity for public comment. And I would urge you to you know, have your voice be heard. And um, the bigger the, the coalition is, the, the bigger your voice is. So uh, that would be uh, my recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, multiple, multiple of us were on the call yesterday. And Jen Tillery was number 11, and she got dropped. And so we're, we're feeling like they don't want to hear from us. Yeah, that's a, one of the challenges, I guess, we have with uh, technology these days. Uh, but uh, don't give up. Keep coming. Thank you. Did we have anybody else? Thank on the you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. AT&T moderator, is there anyone else on the line who would like to make a public comment on this matter? Uh, we have nobody else in queue at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to make a comment and haven't done so, press 1-0 at this time, please. And with that reprompt, we have no additional callers in queue. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. So we have two written comments that will be read into the record by Ms. Renati. The first comment is from Diana Snyder. Dear board members, Prop 19 continues to hurt families mourning the loss of a parent or grandparent. Please work to overturn this horrible legislation and reinstate 58. Please lend your support to SCA 4 to get this issue before voters again. Thank you. The next comment is from Lily, a retired senior from the education field. Although I am not able to attend the BOE meeting in March 2023 as a registered voter in California, I would like to urge all caring legislators and Governor Newsom to support with a yes vote on SCA 4. Uh, it is very important that SCA 4 gets on the March 2024 ballot as it will allow voters an opportunity to restore the important tax per taxpayer protection, Prop 58 and 193 in place from 1986 until February 2021, which was removed by the narrow passage of Prop 19 in 2020. Uh, these taxpayer protections guaranteed that property taxes would not be reassessed upon property transfer from a parent to a child upon death. With your support, you have an opportunity to help many grieving California families to have a choice to remain in their home and or keep any small family business that is a mom and pop rental property, home daycares, family farms and ranches. Additionally, SCA 4 also will help renters secure affordable living arrangements and protect the disabled to remain at their needed family home. Note, new property owners, usually wealthy developers, have evicted long-term time rent tenants and build new developments, which charge high market rates and rental rates to cover its cost basis and expenses. Prop 19 accelerates gentrification and the loss of affordable housing in California statewide, especially for the working class, minorities, and the disabled group. SCA 4 will not change the positive part of Prop 19, such as allowing seniors age 55 to keep their property tax basis if they move to another county in California, help fire victims, and they advertise help to firefighters, which actually received no funding so far. Please show that you care and join our heroes, Senator Ciarto and Assemblyman uh, Philip Chen, authors of SCA 4, with a yes vote on SCA 4 and support affordable housing in California. More at YouTube created by a college student about the city of Sunnyvale and the need for affordable housing. Her grandma commented that the only way to stay in Sunnyvale area would be to inherit her modest home, which the deceptive Prop 19 took that affordable housing solution away for the descendants of longtime Californians. More at included clips of Governor Newsom and the caring rep Ro Khanna of the San Jose area. 
youtube.com. Uh, Watch. It's got the address. Um, thank you. Vote yes on SCA 4, a registered voter in Santa Clara County. Ms. L. Lim, a retired senior from the educational field. P.S. Negative impacts on Prop 19. Many people do not know about the harmful effects of Prop 19 until a loved one or a parent dies. Death triggers property to be reassessed at current market value, part market rate. Most families will be forced to sell their beloved home, including mom and pop businesses, and most likely leave California due to the unaffordable new property tax assessment. If Prop 19 is not reversed, wealthy developers will buy and build market rate mansions and rental properties from the inherited properties. Reason, Prop 19 causes an unaffordable tax increase and forces families to sell long-held properties, including mom and pop businesses, affordable rental units, home-based daycares, and farms. This accelerates gentrification and the loss of affordable housing. New developments charge high, unaffordable market rates. Uh, three minutes is up. Thank you. Time has expired. Thank you. Do we have any other written comments? Or was we that have it? no other. Mm -mm. I, uh, I had oh, a question. Some questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Nardi was, uh, Willie, the first one, uh, you had a several taxpayers, didn't you, on your recitation? I have two taxpayers. One was Diana Snyder, and the other was Lily. Lily. And where is Lily from? I, I don't... I don't have, we don't know. Oh, okay. Based thank on you. what she said, it seems like it's the Bay Area. All right, thank you. Member Gaines. Yeah, I was just thinking one other option would be to contact the author of SCA 4, Searto. I mean, we were looking for, you know, for ways for them to uh, have an impact on the legislation. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And they maybe they've already done that, but. Certainly, that's another path. <coughs> Thank you. Seeing no other comments, I think we're good to move. Seeing no other comments, yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Ron. Thank you, Ms. Ron. We Ms. have an Kip. opportunity to go to lunch right now uh, <clears throat> from 12 to 1, so we could begin on time and take the property tax item later on in the day. Because we have speakers, I think, lined That's up to correct. come in, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have not had a break yet this morning. We had somebody who was going to call in at 11.30. Uh, did that happen? Or? That, we yes, just it did. did. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes, it did, Mr. Schaefer. So, yeah, let's, because I know we have a uh, senator and a, a couple other electeds, so in on, we should honor their tight schedules. Are they coming here or is it going to be online? I think Senator Allen's going to be here. Okay. Right. Some others are going to be online, but they're programmed to, yeah. to come in right after our lunch so, okay. so it might be appropriate one to give them a break at the same time take our little lunch break uh, yeah. member Schaefer yes uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Kim to come forward uh, you have a question one? yes uh, he's the only talented department head that's been silent and you know he's too valuable to be silent uh, uh, I'd like to ask him uh, I'm, I'm sure is this an item that's going to be discussed later on the agenda? or Well, or just to I'd like to be informed by him that he's uh, updated our, our little handout material. and. Uh, so, uh, un unfortunately, Member Schaefer, Mr. Kim is not on the agenda, so it wouldn't be appropriate for him to come up and uh, present on a topic that's not on the agenda. However, I can have him uh, reach out we'll to you to uh, after the meeting and get any questions you have answered. Well, I had a question about maybe some of the interesting things that have gone on in the meeting today could be the object of a press release to go out to the four counties. Maybe he's doing that. Maybe he is, and I don't know. It's just that uh, the report of the taxpayer's advocate was very interesting. Uh, the fact that the pictures from the local areas are being featured. Uh, I think that uh, he could do a little press release uh, on something to go into each of the four districts, and I'd like to... Uh, uh, discuss that with him. Uh, I'll have him. I'll have him uh, contact you after the meeting. Okay, that'll be fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I guess we, we stand adjourned until. Is it? What time did we say? Uh, we'll recess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that you all agree? Mm -hmm. and and yes, that's right. So one hour lunch. Okay. One hour lunch. That's two minutes. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Share that. Share that. Share that. That's not for our convenience, but we're going to what we have.